In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt, to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. An experienced diver and his less experienced brother went on a dive in Cal Spring to celebrate his 20th year as a diver. It was supposed to be an uneventful dive because they had been to this dive location before, but nature had other plans in store for them. Cow Springs is situated close to Peacock Springs State Park in Louisville. It's renowned for its stunning beauty among all the cave diving spots in North Central Florida. Managed by NSS CDS, Cow Spring is actually a sinkhole rather than a traditional spring, with both spring and siphon sides. The water flows toward Cal Spring from the northeast, much like it does for nearby systems like Peacock Orange Grove and Telford. Emerging from a depth of 70 feet, the water gushes up through the boulders at the base of the sinkhole's debris cone before entering one of the two siphon tunnels on its western side. The Cal Spring system consists of both an upstream and downstream section. Locating the entrance to the upstream part can be tricky, especially for first-time divers. It's advisable to dive with someone who knows the system well for the initial exploration. Entering the upstream section of Cal Springs poses a challenge due to a significant restriction. Divers need to maneuver their bodies and equipment through a transition zone that shifts from a roughly vertical to horizontal orientation at a depth of around 40 feet. The current in this area is usually strong, necessitating the use of a pull rope installed permanently in the front section of the cave to assist with navigation. Despite the challenging conditions, visibility is typically excellent, allowing divers to see clearly to depths ranging from 90 to 110 feet. However, it's important to note that the upstream section of Cow Springs is fragile and demands advanced cave diving skills to explore safely. In the downstream section of Cow Springs lies a siphon, which narrows significantly about 200 feet from the open water entrance. Exploring this part of the cave requires advanced cave diving skills due to the strong water flow. Before entering, divers must have excellent control over their buoyancy to navigate safely. The downstream section features breathtaking clay banks and delicate geothite formations, which are easily silted out. Additionally, the high flow and additional restrictions beyond the entrance add to the challenge of diving in this area. Therefore, divers need to be well prepared and cautious to protect both themselves and the fragile underwater environment. Dan McCarthy is an admirable cave diver whose love for the underwater world is evident to those around him. After being certified as a cave diver, he made it his life's mission to dive in different locations. And he also set a remarkable milestone by breaking his own record for the deepest cave dive. Dan has been actively involved in various critical diving missions, including shipwreck archaeology and the recovery of human bodies. His expertise has been crucial to successful rescue operations. Years later, he taught his brother Bill how to dive, and they've been dive buddies ever since. Dan and Bill embarked on their second dive together, gearing up as they arrived at the dive site at Cow Spring. Dan emphasized to his brother the importance of buoyancy control in this cave system. Maintaining proper buoyancy is crucial for protecting the fragile formations found within, especially considering the challenges posed by the high flow, additional restrictions, and depth changes beyond the entrance. With these obstacles in mind, they proceeded with caution. Their dive plan was to reach a depth of 197 feet within the North Siphon Tunnel. This path was somewhat easier to locate compared to the South Siphon Tunnel, which lacked the same visibility since it didn't have the main line most divers relied on. The main line, stretching slightly over 300 feet, guided them through a captivating landscape featuring a mix of low and wide bedding planes, along with an inverted T-fracture. The start of the dive was pretty ordinary, with Dan leading the way. 
They enjoyed the stunning underwater views until they reached their dive spot at 197 feet deep. On the journey back, they had to switch from one guideline to another. Bill went first, grabbing the line and looping it around his neck to free up his hands for the switch. But then, as he tried to secure himself, his buoyancy control device came loose and got snagged on the cave ceiling. In a moment of panic, he kicked and flipped around, inadvertently entangling himself further in the line. Dan swam over to help, but Bill's frantic movements only made things worse, simply resulting in kicking up silt within the cave. Due to the stirred-up sediment, the inside of the cave became so murky that they couldn't even see their own hands in front of their faces. When Bill realized he was in trouble, fear took hold of him, and in situations like this, fear can be deadly. Even though there's a chance to survive, fear alone can be enough to cause harm. Dan, who was observing from close by, could see his brother thrashing about wildly. Despite being within arm's reach of the main line that could lead him to safety, he made the bold decision to try and rescue his brother from his desperate situation. But as he moved to assist, the poor visibility caused Dan to also run into trouble. He couldn't even see his own hands in front of him, let alone find a clear path to safety. Despite spotting a clear exit route that could lead him out of danger, Dan couldn't bear to leave his brother behind in the silt-filled water. In a moment of selflessness driven by familial love, Dan chose to abandon his own chance for escape and instead focus on helping his brother. By breaking the rule of self-preservation for the sake of family, Dan knew he was risking his own safety. And indeed, he soon found himself in trouble alongside his brother, facing the consequences of his courageous decision. Dan's attempt to reach his brother proved futile as he ventured into the silted-out area, losing all sense of his surroundings. Uncertain of Bill's condition in the chaos, Dan could only hope that his brother hadn't lost his breathing regulator in the turmoil. In such treacherous conditions, what hope could these two diving brothers cling to? As Dan pressed on, the thick silt engulfed him, isolating him from any sign of his brother. The lack of visibility left him disoriented and stripping away all sense of direction. He found himself adrift in a murky void, unable to discern his current position or which way to turn. Every attempt to move forward or backward seemed futile, plunging him into despair. With each passing moment, fear gripped him tighter, escalating into full-blown panic as he struggled to regulate his breathing amidst the mounting uncertainty. As Dan searched for a way out, he accidentally bumped into a wall in the darkness. This made him realize he needed to stay calm to avoid letting fear take over. After calming down, he had an idea. He noticed that the light reflected off his two watches, but he still wasn't sure exactly where he was. He also didn't have a clear memory of where he had come from or where he was headed. Despite this, he used the faint reflections from his watches to start finding his way through the cave's challenging conditions. Dan continued his journey in the dark, relying solely on his senses to guide him through the water. Whenever he realized he was going the wrong way, he made efforts to correct his path. After some time, he managed to find the main route. Despite his efforts, he was still struggling to catch his breath, and his oxygen supply was running dangerously low. Fearful thoughts crowded his mind as he contemplated the possibility of his impending demise within the cave. Panic set in when he realized he had less than an hour of air left and was deep underwater. But in the face of this dire situation, Dan refused to surrender to despair. He resolved to keep pushing forward until he found a way out, determined to survive against all odds. The first thing Dan thought to do was call for help, but to his surprise, he found his brother Bill waiting for him at the surface. Bill had made it out of the cave too. How did this happen? It turned out that Bill, after getting stuck in a silted out section, remembered Dan's advice about staying calm underwater. So he focused and grabbed onto the main line, following it back to safety. He was able to do this because he remembered Dan's teaching that panicking while diving often leads to a disastrous end. His brother had taught him that before going cave diving, it's super important to know all the dangers involved. 
Divers need to watch out for things like not being able to see well, getting tangled up, strong underwater currents, and sudden changes in the water. Knowing about these dangers helps divers get ready and make smart choices while they're diving. Also, when divers experience poor buoyancy control, they can kick up silt, which makes it impossible to see anything. They might also accidentally let go of the guidelines and get lost trying to find their way back out of the cave. That's exactly what happened to him, but he decided to stay calm and carefully find his way back using the guideline, so he didn't get lost forever underwater. Two experienced divers embarked on one mission, diving to the well casing located at 1,976 feet within the Little River Springs. Diving to this depth has claimed the lives of some, but others are not deterred. However, an unfortunate turn of events happened on this dive that would forever change their lives. In the state of Florida, there are many different springs, which are places where water comes up from underground. One of these springs is called Little River Springs, and it's located in the northern part of Florida. Little River Springs is pretty big, covering about 125 acres of land, and it's inside the Swanee River County Park. This is a perfect spot for snorkeling, swimming, canoeing, kayaking, and scuba diving. All year round, the temperature of the spring stays the same at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like having an air conditioner during summertime, but in winter, it's totally different. Little River Springs has water that's clear, not like the tea-colored Swanee River, and the temperature of the water is different too. The spring is quite long, stretching about 150 feet, and inside it, there's a cave system that goes on for over 1,200 feet. The cave has one main tunnel, but as you go deeper, around 90 to 100 feet, you'll find smaller paths branching off. The farther you explore, the cave changes shape. It gets lower and wider, and the walls and floors get covered in thicker silt compared to the entrance, where the passages are big and rocky with clear water. If you dive all the way to the end, you'll come across the well casing. It's a man-made well that a farmer built to use the clean water from the spring. This is the most popular dive location for professional cave divers who choose Little River Springs. Mae Jones started cave diving when she was just a kid because she loved swimming and watching videos about exploring caves. This passion led her to study marine biology, and after she finished school, she decided to make cave diving a major part of her life. She went on lots of diving trips with her friends and other divers, having all sorts of adventures. It was one of these trips that she met Luke, who later became her husband. Their shared love for diving made their relationship special. May's passion for diving didn't just stop at going on dives herself. She also taught many other divers and became well-loved in the cave diving community. One summer morning, May and Luke planned to go diving at Little River Springs. Their goal was to reach the well casing, which is about 1,976 feet into the cave, and then turn back. They had a plan to dive together and stick to it. They got to the dive spot around 7 a.m. and started their dive at about 8.15 a.m., each using their own scooters. They chose to use scooters because they help divers cover more distance underwater and save air. With scooters, they could move faster between different areas while diving. To navigate through the water, they followed the main line, which isn't far from the 100-foot arrow. Along the way, they found several shortcut tunnels that led to different parts of the cave. As May and Luke continued their dive, they had a plan in place. They agreed that once either of them used up one-third of their air, it was time to start heading back to the surface. They figured that by the time they reached this point, they must have reached the well casing. They had heard stories of other divers who had tragically drowned after reaching the well casing. They believed those accidents happened because those divers were inexperienced, unlike themselves. Being experienced and qualified divers, they felt confident that such a mishap could never happen to them. However, they overlooked the fact that underwater conditions can sometimes be unpredictable. Despite their skills and training, they were not immune to the potential dangers that lurked beneath the surface. 
They dived through the main tunnel until they reached about 900 feet deep, where the main path splits into two, the Serpentine Way and the Merry-Go-Round Tunnels. These tunnels take different routes that eventually lead to a big room called the Florida Room. To reach the well casing, they had to follow a permanent line and make a sharp left turn. As they kept diving, they came across a place called the Dome Room. It's got a sandy bottom and is covered in thick mud and silt, which makes it harder to see and move around. When divers reach this part, they have to turn off their scooters and leave them on the side. From there, they have to dive through the mud and silt to continue their journey through the cave. As they were heading toward the well casing, Luke noticed that May was having trouble with her buoyancy device, which helps divers stay at the right depth underwater. He swam over to her to see what was wrong. After checking her equipment, he figured out the problem. A part called the anti-collapse tube inside the counterlung had come loose. This tube helps keep the counterlung from collapsing, which could make it hard for May to breathe. Luke carefully fixed the tube, making sure it was back in its proper place. Once everything was sorted out, they were able to continue their dive without any more issues. And finally, they reached their destination, the well casing. After exploring the area around the well casing, Luke decided it was time for them to head back to the surface. He signaled to May that they should start making their way out of the cave. She seemed to understand the signal, but she didn't respond in her usual way. He noticed that she looked uneasy, but when he asked her if everything was okay, she reassured him that she was fine. He assumed she was just feeling a bit shaken up from the earlier troubles with her equipment. Thinking everything was under control, he led the way as they began their journey back toward the entrance of the cave. As they exited a tunnel at about 400 feet deep, he realized that May wasn't following behind him as she usually would. He waited for a couple of minutes, expecting to see her emerge from the tunnel, but there was no sign of her. Feeling surprised and a bit worried, Lou continued swimming ahead, hoping to catch sight of May somewhere ahead, maybe about two to 300 feet away. But even after covering that distance, there was still no sign of her. It slowly dawned on him that he was now alone in the dark underwater cave. He couldn't understand how May had fallen so far behind him without him noticing. Confusion clouded his mind as he tried to recall exactly when she had stopped following him. Deciding to backtrack to the well casing where they had been together, he hoped he might find her along the way. And as he swam back, he encountered something unexpected. The area around the well casing had become filled with silt, making it nearly impossible to see. The once clear water had turned murky, drastically reducing visibility. He couldn't make out much of anything around him. With growing concern, he began searching through the silt, hoping to find May, but his efforts were in vain. Panic started to set in as he realized the gravity of the situation. She was nowhere to be found, and he was alone in the depths of the cave with no clear way forward. Feeling desperate and anxious, Luke began banging on his tank, hoping that she would hear the sound and find her way back to him through the murky water. However, after a while, he stopped banging as he realized that his decompression time, the time needed to safely ascend to the surface after a deep dive, was starting to add up. He knew it was important to begin his ascent soon to avoid potential health risks. With a heavy heart, he started swimming toward the surface, hoping that she had already made her way out of the cave and was waiting for him above. He silently prayed for a miracle to happen, desperately wishing to find her safe and sound. As he went through the process of decompression, slowly ascending toward the surface, his heart sank when he reached the top and realized that his wife wasn't there. His worst fear had come true. May was still down there, lost among the silt. In a state of panic, he called out for help from nearby divers, explaining the dire situation to them. Without hesitation, they immediately sprang into action, reporting the incident to the authorities and initiating a rescue operation to find and save May. Two divers went to find May, but they didn't let Luke join them because he was visibly upset and shaken. They headed into the deep water, but the visibility was very poor because of all the silt in the well casing. It made it hard for them to see anything clearly. 
They had to stop their search because it was too risky for them to continue in those conditions. The next day, the rescue team returned to the cave to continue their search for May. They were determined to find her and bring her home safely. After searching for some time, they tragically discovered her lifeless body floating in the water. She was tangled in a loose line, and it seemed like she had been trying to free herself. The news of May's passing was devastating for the cave diving community, and it was especially heartbreaking for Luke, who had lost his partner and soulmate. Despite the sadness, he found some comfort in knowing that May had died doing what she loved most, exploring the underwater world. May's passing served as a reminder of the dangers of cave diving and the importance of safety precautions. Her memory would live on in the hearts of those who knew and loved her, and her passion for diving would continue to inspire others in the community. A 21-year-old diver and his friend got lost while diving in the Devil's Spring system. While trying to find their way, one of the divers suffered equipment failure and they had to share a single air tank. They had to find their way or they would suffer the worst fate when their air ran out. For lovers of diving, the Devil's Spring system in Florida might be one of the state's best-kept secrets, hiding in plain sight for those who desire to explore its wonders. Officially known as the Devil's Spring system, it actually is a collection of three springs – Devil's Eye, Devil's Ear, and Little Devil. Together, these springs work their magic, producing 80 million gallons of fresh aquifer water every day, earning them the prestigious title of a first-magnitude spring group. The location of this incredible diving spot is the renowned Ginny Springs Park, which owns the land where the springs reside. Among them, Little Devil Spring stands out as a slender crack in the earth that descends approximately 50 feet into the ground and is only 4 feet wide. At the bottom of this opening, you'll discover two tiny caves, although they don't go very deep into the earth. The springs called Devil's Ear and Devil's Eye are connected to each other. This connection gives divers the chance to explore underground passages that are about 30,000 feet long. You just need to be specially trained before you can navigate these two springs, because they are linked by a narrow path that's difficult for regular divers. The tight tunnel that leads out of the Devil's Eye connects to the main passage in Devil's Ear, and it opens up into different tunnels that branch out. The farthest someone has gone into these tunnels is about 4,300 feet. More people use Devil's Ear Spring for diving because it has a special area where trained divers can go into the cavern. But the strong flow of water from this spring, which is about as much as 30 million gallons per day, makes it a bit challenging for divers to enter. Luke Richardson was 21 years old and lived where there were caves quite close. On a certain day, some of his friends were going for diving lessons, and he joined them since he could swim. As they trained, he watched in awe and that cemented it big time. He researched the famous divers and decided he would take up this passion and try to learn all he could. Soon, he got trained and joined his friend in doing lots of caving. On one of his dives, he met 27-year-old Gary Lockheed, who was a newly certified advanced cave diver. In his career, Gary had explored several caves, and he soon became close friends with Luke. On most occasions, the two dived together as Gary helped Luke advance in his dive career. Luke and Gary teamed up with two of their friends to explore the Devil Spring system. The idea was to divide themselves into two smaller groups. Team A would include Axel and Brand, while Group B would consist of Luke and Gary. Team A planned to go to the cornflakes section of the cave, which is about 500 feet away, to explore and take pictures. This is because they are more experienced and advanced. Luke and Gary plan to dive 164 feet deep. When they arrived at the cave that morning by 8 a.m., everyone got ready for the dive. Their underwater adventure began in the section of the cave known as the Devil's Eye. Even though Devil's Eye and Devil's Ear are very close to each other, it doesn't matter which one you use to enter because they connect underwater in a large passage called the Gallery. They swam for a while until they reached this gallery. Alongside the gallery, there's a series of tunnels that are all connected. These are called the catacombs. These tunnels are unlike the others in the cave because they don't have any guidelines to follow. 
This was done on purpose because instructors want their students to have the opportunity to practice using reels as they navigate through these tunnels. As they kept on swimming, they eventually reached the far end of the gallery. At this point, the cave made a sudden and sharp turn to the right, creating a narrow passage that divers had to carefully maneuver through. This tight spot is called the lips. Once they successfully passed through the lips, they found themselves in a spacious room. On the opposite side of this room, the underwater guideline leads through something known as the keyhole. When they reached the keyhole, they descended from a depth of 70 feet to 90 feet. This part of the dive was incredibly exciting for them, and they took some time to admire the beautiful underwater scenery. After enjoying the sights at this depth, they continued their exploration at a depth of 164 feet, while Team A continued on their journey. After Luke and Gary achieved their dive goal, it was time to leave, and they began their exit. They passed through the same route, but soon got confused after they got to the catacombs. They tried to swim out of the cave and realized they were lost in the group of tunnels and had dived the wrong way, and they could no longer see the permanent line. They tried to find their way out for about 20 minutes until they came to a junction and could see the ripple of surface reflections and fin toward them. They thought they were back on track, but when they surfaced, they realized they were in what they could immediately see was an air chamber. They weren't out, they were trapped. Luke was now getting anxious. This wasn't how he thought the dive would turn out. However, Gary tried calming him, despite being scared himself. But he knew getting overwhelmed by their situation wouldn't help them one bit. With their gas level running low, Gary knew that if they tried to dive again and wander without a plan, they could end up deeper than wherever they were and would eventually perish without finding the way out. Their main fear was that the Team A guys, who were planning a longer dive that day, would not know of their dilemma until they had surfaced, which would have been too late for them. Their fear grew even more when they remembered that their friends did not have extensive knowledge of the cave. While planning the dive route, their location was not mapped out in their plan, so the others had not been there on any of their dives. Gary began to wonder what could happen as they stayed in the air chamber. When would their gas run out? Would they get lost when they tried to find their way out? When would their friends notice that they had not exited and were overdue? As they floated in the cold water, they were not sure how they would survive. Soon Gary signaled and asked Luke if he was calm enough to dive, as they needed to find their way. But they can't do that with fear in them. Their only option was to act, because if they waited for their friends, a rescue may turn into a body retrieval. So they agreed to retrace their steps and try to find the permanent line while also searching for the dive lights of their friends. After about 25 minutes in the air pocket, they began the dive that would determine the fate of their survival. Gary took the lead and Luke followed closely behind. As they dived, they were constantly checking the water for lights. They thought of lowering a light on their search reel to attract attention, but wanted to save the batteries and they had no idea if the Team A friends would be swimming below them or not. Sometimes, Gary thought he saw lights, but it was only a reflection from his torch. After about 15 minutes, he saw another glow from afar. He flashed his light, but the glow faded away. As he was about to ask Luke if he had seen the glow, he noticed that he was gasping for breath. Gary drew him closer, and he realized that there was an equipment failure and his tank was not supplying air. Immediately, he drew him close, and they began sharing his dive air. Thankfully, Gary, being the ever-careful guy, had a spare scuba octopus regulator, so they could comfortably share his air. With this in place, they had to stay close throughout their dive. The octopus is an additional part of the scuba diving equipment that connects to the main part of the breathing gear. It functions in the same way as the main part you use for breathing underwater. The octopus serves an important purpose. If someone diving runs out of air, they need to find a backup source of air quickly. That's why the octopus is usually designed with bright colors, like yellow, and is positioned in a specific place on the chest, forming a triangle from the chin down to the lower rib cage. This method of having an octopus is much safer than the alternative, which is called buddy breathing. In buddy breathing, both divers share a single regulator, 
which is the part you breathe through. However, this can be risky because if your diving partner becomes panicked or unwilling to give you the regulator when you need it, it can lead to dangerous situations. So having the octopus as a backup is a much better and safer way to ensure you have access to air when you need it. However, with the octopus, there is a risk of quickly running out of air. So Gary and Luke had to find their way or bump into Team A, or they risked drowning as they were already running out of air. They began to ascend rapidly, but this soon had a negative effect on Luke, who started feeling dizzy. Gary had to support him as they dove along. Suddenly, they saw a faint light, and Gary flashed his light as well. Soon, the light drew closer, and they realized it was Team A, Axel and Bran. It was then that Gary realized that they were coming out of a passageway in the catacombs that they had mistook for their dive route. Upon seeing them, Axel was confused because they should have exited. When they further saw that they were sharing air and how Luke was feeling, they came to their aid. Gary signaled to them that they had lost their way. Without delay, the diver supported Luke and tried to keep him awake as they made their ascent. They were able to exit the water successfully, and they got immediate medical help for Luke. He was diagnosed with mild decompression sickness and was discharged after being treated with 100% oxygen. An experienced cave diver went on a series of dives with the Karst Underwater Research Team at Wikiwachi Springs in 2012. However, no one knew there would be a shocking turn of events after a successful dive to a depth of 180 feet. Would he survive this expedition? Located in Spring Hill, Florida, Wikiwachi Springs stands as a captivating natural tourist spot. Its name, Wikiwachi, originates from the Seminoles, signifying Little Spring or Winding River in their language. This enchanting attraction was brought to life in 1947 by the ingenuity of stunt swimmer and showman Newt Perry. Perry's inspiration for the show was drawn from innovative underwater air hose breathing techniques. The entry point to the Wikiwachi system is a narrow fissure, roughly the dimensions of a standard door, positioned 75 feet beneath the water's surface. This passage, just spacious enough for one person to traverse, descends to a profound depth of 170 to 190 feet before unveiling a vast cavern room. Here, enthusiasts and explorers have the opportunity to delve further, undertaking dives to meticulously map the intricate expanses of the Wikiwachi system. Wikiwachi Spring flows gracefully from the base of a gently sloping conical depression. The dimensions of the spring pool span 165 feet from east to west, and 210 feet from north to south. Delving into the azure depths, the spring reaches a depth of 45 feet at its center vent. The water is crystal clear, adorned with a light greenish-blue color. Beyond its natural beauty, Wikiwachi Springs doubles as a captivating tourist attraction. Here, visitors can witness mesmerizing underwater performances by mermaids, captivating women adorned in fishtails and whimsical outfits. The spectacle unfolds in an aquarium-like setting along the spring of the Wikiwachi River. Additionally, the locale offers an array of activities, including a water park named Buccaneer Bay, scenic riverboat rides, and the option to explore the waters through kayak and paddleboard rentals. Marcin Kay had two profound passions that illuminated his life, his dedicated work in the realm of computers and his exhilarating adventures in cave diving. After experiencing a fruitful six-year career in information technology at Life South Community Blood Center, Marson persistently nurtured his love for diving. His adventurous spirit was a defining characteristic, as family and friends fondly described him as a daredevil who found joy in activities like cave diving, surfing, and even daring ventures like skydiving. However, his mother was always afraid when he went on these explorations. She once candidly expressed her disapproval of his interest in cave diving to Marson, but he explained that this was his passion and he didn't mind giving his life for it. 
On the evening of March 31, 2012, Marcin K., a 29-year-old skilled cave diver, embarked on a series of dives alongside the Karst Underwater Research Team at Wikiwachi Springs. This team explores the Karst Aquifers, which are caves hidden deep below the surface where scientists can't easily go. These underwater caves are really important for our well-being because they hold a lot of water that we use. Picture them as intricate networks of tunnels beneath the ground. Thanks to improvements in diving knowledge, equipment, and techniques, we can now explore these mysterious underwater caves. This is where the Karst Underwater Research Team comes in. They play a crucial role in this endeavor. They volunteer and use their own equipment to dive into these tricky waters to gather and report scientific information. This enables them to figure out how these cave systems work. Through the acquisition of this information, scientists studying the Earth can help protect the environment and help everyone understand more about these hidden places. Marson and the team's next destination for underwater exploration was the Wikiwachi Springs, and they were scheduled to dive after the conclusion of the final mermaid show for the day. Equipped and ready, Kay, accompanied by five other divers, submerged into the water a little after 4.30 p.m., making their way down to the open cavern area situated 175 feet below the surface. As they delved deeper, they came across a cavern with intricate rock formations, which presented them with a challenging yet fascinating environment at a depth of around 100 feet. The underwater landscape had a serene surface with a striking deep blue color. The man-made decorations and air hoses added to the underwater scenery, creating a habitat for turtles and fish that gracefully swam around, enhancing the overall experience of the dive. After Marson successfully explored the cave at a depth of 180 feet, he signaled to his team that he was ready to leave the maze of tight rocks. Getting out of the cave was tricky because they had to go through a tough entrance. To exit, they had to swim up through a strong flow of water. They followed a special rope, a half inch wide and orange in color, which led them from 180 feet to 142 feet. At this point, the cave got a bit narrower, but the rope guided them through the largest opening. The rope continued to lead them to a depth of 68 feet, where they could always see daylight. Instead of sticking to the ropes he usually followed, Marson suddenly went into a very narrow part of the underwater crevasse. It seems he didn't plan to do this. It was more like a quick reaction to a problem he faced while coming up from the deep water. Apparently, Marson had what's called a cerebral arterial gas embolism. This condition is quite serious. It can make your brain work differently, causing confusion, sudden blindness, being unable to move, having seizures, or even passing out within just a few minutes. If it happens after you've come back to the surface, it's very risky and can lead to severe problems or even death, even if you get help quickly. When this happens underwater, the diver is in great danger due to a loss of consciousness, and sadly, it often results in drowning because the person can't react in time. This is why it's important for cave divers to be really careful, plan things well, and be aware of their health conditions, and be aware of the risks to avoid these kinds of emergencies. Despite having safety divers nearby and extra gas cylinders ready, Marson quickly went up into an area that even divers using a side mount approach couldn't easily reach. His fellow divers tried to communicate using lights and touch, and they attempted to pull him back but it didn't work. Marson was still moving, but he didn't directly respond to their signals. Realizing the urgency of this worrisome situation, the divers decided to swim up to the surface and inform the other researchers. A rescue dive team rushed back into the water, but by the time they reached Marson, just three minutes later, his mask was on his forehead and his breathing regulator was out of his mouth. Unfortunately, he had already passed away. Marson's demise was a shock and sad news for his family and friends. It was a hard pill to swallow, but that's just one of the risks, difficulties, and dangers of cave diving, even when safety measures are in place. It shows how important it is to understand the challenges of underwater environments 
and to communicate quickly and effectively in emergencies, emphasizing the need for caution and preparedness in this adventurous but risky activity. Following Marson's passing, the coroner investigated and found that he had suffered from a cerebral arterial gas embolism before his death. When they checked Marson's equipment later on, they discovered that he still had about half of his gas supply in both tanks, and his breathing regulators seemed to be in good working order. The medical examiner clarified that Marson didn't drown, as some initially thought. Instead, the cause was an air embolism due to surfacing too quickly. An embolism is like an air bubble that, that blocks an artery, cutting off blood supply to a part of the body. In Marsh's case, authorities explained that this bubble got stuck in his heart, preventing blood from flowing into his lungs. Understanding what happened to Marson reminds us of the importance of ascending slowly and safely in cave diving to prevent these serious medical issues. Every diver must be cautious and aware of potential risks in underwater exploration. A 38-year-old man with an adventurous spirit went on a diving adventure in Jackson Blue Springs with his friend. The dive was going well until the man decided to dive into a narrow and tight spot that wasn't marked on their map. Florida has lots of freshwater springs, but there's a spring that most people in Florida don't really know about. It's called Jackson Blue Springs, and it's in Mariana, Florida. This spring is very clear and is great for activities like swimming, diving, snorkeling, and fishing. You can also have a picnic there and play volleyball. In the 1800s, the springs were on big farms and were used as a camp during the war. After the war, people liked to have picnics, vacations, and baptisms at Blue Springs. The water from Blue Springs goes to a big pond called Merritt's Mill Pond, which is good for fishing. The water in Jackson Blue Springs is usually between 68 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit all year. It pumps out a lot of water, about 64.6 million gallons every day. The spring has a maximum depth of 81 to 90 feet and an average visibility of 81 to 90 feet. For the past 40 years, the main spring and the area around it have been taken care of by Jackson County. People can swim, have picnics, and learn scuba diving there. You can rent pavilions for the day, and if you want to go cave diving, you need to have a certification and pay a fee. The Cave Adventures Group is the only one allowed in the off-season, but they can take divers on trips all year. If you're not scared and want to explore deep underwater, you'll discover a big cave system that both beginners and experts have explored. Ben Strelnick was 38 years old, and he was a friendly, open-minded, and adventurous person. He liked to have fun and loved being with good people, having a good time, and listening to good music. He enjoyed outdoor sports, especially scuba diving. Ben also liked doing things like snowboarding, climbing rocks, riding bikes in the mountains, jet skiing, playing mini golf, swimming with big whale sharks, and paddling in a kayak. In 2019, Ben finished college at Johnson State College in Vermont. He studied outdoor education and became certified as a mountain and wilderness EMT as well. When the pandemic was happening, Ben worked as a volunteer EMT for the Rutland Regional Ambulance Corps. He was also active in his community. He had a job in North Carolina with Dan, Divers Alert Network, where he worked as a medic. He worked on a hotline that was open all the time for scuba divers from everywhere. People could call to ask about emergencies while diving underwater. On May 26, 2023, an unforgettable event took place for the Strelnik family and the diving community at large. Ben Strelnik, along with a co-worker and friend, embarked on a journey. Together, they made their way to Jackson Blue Springs. The weather on that day was splendid and upon reaching the park, the decision to engage in a diving expedition seemed right. While in the spring, the flow of the water seemed normal and the visibility of the water was great, the perfect condition for a dive. After thoroughly completing all essential safety checks, Ben and his friend prepared themselves by wearing their diving gear and securing their mouthpieces. 
With everything in place, they confidently entered the cave, ready to explore its depths. The beginning part of the cave, the initial few hundred feet, is not too deep, only about 40 to 50 feet. The main path inside the cave goes down to about 90 feet, where there's a noticeable crack or opening. As the two divers went down, they reached a depth of about 79 feet, which is around the average depth for this cave. They paused their descent and signaled each other with a thumbs up, then they grabbed onto the guideline that helped them navigate. With the guidelines secured, they bravely continued their journey into the cave. Even though it was a bit dark, they could see a distance of around 80 feet ahead of them. The rocks, made of white limestone, were easily noticeable on both sides of their path. It's important to be cautious when diving in the caves to not stir up the sediment at the bottom, as doing so can make the water cloudy and hard to see through. The divers had to be careful not to touch the walls, floor, or ceiling of the cave with their flippers to maintain visibility. As they continued their dive, more than an hour had gone by when they got closer to the first T-junction, the point where the path splits into two. Just before they reached the first point where the path split in two, there was a small narrow area that was a bit hard to notice and wasn't marked on their map. While they were passing by this tight spot, Ben managed to spot this small area that was difficult to pass through. But what caught his attention even more was a guideline that led further down this narrow passage. The presence of this guideline suggested that someone had been there before and had ventured through this tight space, possibly discovering something interesting and then returning. This discovery piqued Ben's curiosity and made him eager to learn more. Being the more experienced diver between the two, he took on the responsibility and decided to lead the way by entering the restricted passage. To help them navigate through this tight space, they were using a Sidewinder breathing device, which is designed to be smaller and more manageable in confined spaces. This equipment choice boosted Ben's confidence in maneuvering through the narrow area. As he was about to dive into this unknown territory, his anticipation grew and he wondered what they might find beyond the restriction where someone else had left a clue by placing the guideline. Ben began to approach the entrance of the narrow passage. The inside of the passage was silted out due to sediment in the water, making it difficult to see clearly. However, his strong desire to explore and discover new things overpowered any hesitation he might have felt. This eagerness to explore was the driving force behind his decision. The presence of silt in underwater environments can create dangerous situations for divers using scuba gear. This is particularly true in places like enclosed spaces or areas where divers can't easily swim up to the surface. In such situations, the silt can cloud the water, severely reducing visibility. This is especially concerning in underwater caves where the lack of visibility makes it challenging to find the way out. In cases where divers lose their sense of direction, panic can set in, leading to frantic movements that stir up more silt, worsening the situation even further. Considering these potential dangers, divers need to approach such situations with caution and be aware of the risks involved in exploring areas where visibility is compromised. Regardless, he decided to enter the passage. With great care and a determined spirit, he started moving forward, advancing bit by bit with the assistance of the guideline. The guideline served as his lifeline, guiding him deeper into the confined space. Unfortunately, he didn't realize that the walls of the cave were gradually closing in on him due to the limited visibility caused by the sediment. Ben continued his progress, pushing himself forward every few seconds. He wasn't aware the cave walls were inching closer until he began to feel the pressure on his sides. As the walls tightened around him, he recognized that he was in a tight spot. He came to understand that he couldn't move any further ahead, and with the restricted space, he was unable to turn around and go back the way he came. Ben discovered that he was stuck tightly in the narrow passage, unable to move any further. A sense of panic began to creep over him, but he was fully aware that giving in to panic could have dire consequences. 
He understood that panicking in such a situation could lead to a tragic outcome. He realized that he needed to think quickly and find a way out of this difficult situation. His diving partner, who was with him on this expedition, sensed that something had gone wrong as they couldn't see much inside the constrained passage. It was evident that Ben had encountered a problem and was unable to proceed. The tightness of the space left no room for him to maneuver or withdraw himself. Despite having less experience than Ben and no experience with a closed-circuit diving device, his partner attempted to assist in whatever way he could. After some time went by, it started to become evident that Ben was unable to release himself. His friend was left with no choice but to make the difficult choice to abandon him and go back to the surface to ask for assistance. Even though this decision might cause many people to feel guilty for surviving, it was the right decision to at least save one of the divers, if not both. The authorities were informed and they reached out to Ed Sorensen, a well-known cave diver famous for his rescues in caves all around the world. Regrettably, when they finally reached Ben, it was already too late. He had already passed away. Ben suffered a fate that many would conclude was avoidable. But at times, curiosity can get the best of anyone. The adventurous Ben is survived and remembered by his mom, Janet Goldmark, and his dad, Hal Strelnick. He also leaves behind his stepmom and his stepbrothers and stepsisters. Additionally, he is survived by his cousins. Many close friends also held him dear in their hearts. His family finds comfort in the fact that he died doing what he loved. His mother revealed that he knew and accepted the risk involved in diving. He even confidently told his mother, If I died diving, at least know that I died happy. We would like to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another.